Well, we are at the California Antiquarian Book Fair, February 8th, 2020, here in beautiful Pasadena, and it is beautiful today. We're here with Langdon Manor Books, LLC, and I have the pleasure of talking to Adam Schachter. Um, the extraordinary history of the everyday is what your business card says, and I'm mm -hmm. going to read the rest of it, and then we'll go back to the beginning of Adam. Uh, it's specialists in American social movements, American personal narratives, photo albums, and outsider books. It sounds like we've got a lot of really great things to talk about. But let's start at the very beginning. Um, tell me a little bit about your background, where you were born and raised, uh, family life, high school, college. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, parents moved to Jersey when I was about a year old in 1971. I grew up in a very interesting hometown uh, that has influenced my business actually um, mm. to uh, my town was, was very African-American oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually sang lift every voice and sing at assemblies instead of the national anthem mm -hmm. until my mom found out about it um, and kind of had an impact on the public schools, which, you know, endeared me to a lot of my classmates. Um, so that that's childhood was Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, I uh, went to Rutgers Newark my freshman year in college, but mostly because I wanted to play volleyball. And I got to travel the country sitting the bench for their division one volleyball team. And I hate the cold. Mm -hmm. um, and so ended up going to University of Arizona for the rest of my undergraduate. Never mm -hmm. wanted to live in the East ever again. I uh, don't like the cold. Um, a lot of my friends at Arizona were from Texas, uh, mm -hmm. and so I applied to law schools in Texas, and that's where I went to law school in Dallas oh. uh, at SMU. And so that brings us to a timeline of background. you in law school, finishing law school, mm -hmm. I assume, and moving on to be a lawyer. Correct. Just, oh. Correct. Yeah, Ooh. I am. Um, gosh, I think I was a lawyer for almost eighteen years. Okay. Um, I um, was trained in consumer bankruptcy, mm -hmm. uh, which is more like being a therapist than a lawyer. We're, we're not <laughs> junkyard dog litigators usually. It's more hand-holding and solving problems and getting people back on their feet. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked it for a really long time until this world started to start to take over that and time. And how did this world even, did, were you raised with books in the house? Oh no, I was raised, raised as a collectibles dealer. You were raised as a collectibles uh, dealer, yeah. okay. So when I was eight, I started buying and selling baseball cards. Okay. Uh, one of the greatest life lesson gifts my parents ever gave me was instead of giving me money to buy those cards, they insisted I get a job. And so mm -hmm. at nine, mm -hmm. uh, at the age of nine, I got, my brother gave me one of his paper routes and I used the money from that to fund my new uh, sports card habit. Uh, when I was nine in 1979, one of the first national uh, price guides came out for baseball cards and I devoured it. I literally read it line by line, you know, Mickey Mantle, $3, <laughs> that kind of thing. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I was buying and selling. Um, I had a really phenomenal experience related to the movie The Natural and the oh. props involved in that movie that led to me becoming kind of a dealer where I had a mail order business for several years starting at the age of 14. I was going to say at what age? Yeah. 14? Uh, yeah. And, um, and that led to doing shows and stuff like that. And oh, wow. even when I was like 9 or 10 going to baseball card shows, I would see the dealers on the other end and think that's got to be the greatest job ever, you know, not <laughs> knowing that they're living on the road and eating nothing but Twinkies and stuff like that. But I was nine and it looked great. So um, dealing in sports collectibles uh, gave me spending money all through college, um, helped me buy my first house, all that kind of stuff. I'd always been a reader, um, although not in the last eight, 10 years, I'm more of a, I listen to books, uh, unless it's books about my subject areas yeah. or the history of the book trade. I, I love sure. learning about the history of the book trade. Um, in 2002 or three, my parents were visiting me in Houston mm -hmm. and um, a, a common childhood thing that led to the baseball cards was flea markets and garage sale stuff. Mm -hmm. So we went to an estate sale. I bought uh, what I hoped was a first edition of Charlotte's Web because I thought I'd read somewhere that first editions might be worth something. And it took 10 hours of research and asking dealers on eBay about the book to understand why it wasn't a first. Mm -hmm. 
and I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. the, just the, it's so nerdy and boring to many, but mm -hmm. that's why we have jobs in this business. That's right. uh, Cause there's a lot of work anyway. Um, but I was hooked. I just thought it was so cool. Mm -hmm. And in, in the course of those few weeks after the Charlotte's web book, you know, I turned three dollars and thirty five dollars. Yeah. I found BookThink mm -hmm. and um, the dealers who were teaching me about the Charlotte's Web book. I, I also came across uh, learning that Dr. Seuss books might be worth something, but there was this really expensive bibliography. And so within days of, of selling the Charlotte's Web book, I bought a Dr. Seuss book with a dust jacket called Come Over to My House. Um, uh, it, it's it's. I can't remember Dr. Seuss's full name, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a pseudonym Theodore. of his name, wrote, come over to my house. Anyway, somewhere I'd read that the dust jackets on these books might be valuable. This dust jacket looked like someone had eaten it, vomited it. They I mean, it was do. just awful. Yeah. Yeah. But one of those dealers was kind enough to look in his Seuss bibliography. He confirmed it was a first, and that dollar thrift shop purchase turned into like a $390 eBay sale. Mm -hmm. And that was like, this is cool. So from 02, 03, whenever that happened to about 07, 08, I just dove into the book thing stuff. Mm. I'd go to estate sales and garage sales and hope to make a couple hundred bucks mm -hmm. every month. And um, I gave it up entirely around 2008. Um, my law practice took off. One of my buddies um, was following along with the collectible books and was dabbling in book thing. And so he bought that stock for me. And then 2010 or 2011, I got the bug to buy and sell again and started you know, having fun again. And then everything changed um, November 4th of either 2010 or 2011. It, November 4th is my wife's birthday. That's okay. why I'm able to remember the day. But I walked into a room, which I now know was a curated library of someone who collected Russian literature, Russian everything. But, but most people interested in books at that sale walked in and walked out because yes. everything was in Cyrillic. Mm -hmm. And um, that same friend who had bought the inventory a couple of years earlier, I'd seen him a few weeks earlier. And he said, you know, if you ever see anything in Cyrillic that looks interesting, know that I keep selling Russian books to the same group of people in Brighton. Uh, so take a second look. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I bought these 30 pamphlets um, because I thought they were interesting. They were, they were pretty. Um, and uh, it turns out they weren't pamphlets. They, they were books uh, printed in Russian refugee camps. DP pamphlets. They were DP pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And as luck would have it, uh, Philip Penka, oh, yeah. about six months earlier, like if, if these things happened much earlier, yeah. I'd probably still be a lawyer. So, right. so that was the big spark. Philip had won the National Collegiate Book Collecting Contest yep. maybe months earlier, and his paper was online. Yeah. And so that was the first time that I was ever, ex even though I'd been on BookThink all those years, it was the first time I was ever exposed to scholarship turning a kind of neat in piece of paper into this cultural artifact that yes. sort of resonates with, you know, wow, you know, the person that first got this mm -hmm. was desperately trying to hold on to culture as they didn't know what's going to happen to their lives. So I reached out to Philip and, you know, I now realize what a <laughs> email that would have been for him when my understanding was he had found maybe 90 of these books in five years of looking for them. Yeah. And I found 30 copies that were pristine, yeah. you know, in one day. So he bought them for me, from me, and it, it didn't hurt that that $60 turned into a ridiculous multiple of $60. Mm -hmm. and, and Philip and I are still friends, actually. Yep. At the time, um, he also guy. didn't know he was going to, to be an antiquarian bookseller. Right. He enjoyed it, but he, so, so we've stayed in touch all those, all those years, and I, we finally met face-to-face -face at a fair last year. But anyway, so what kept happening after that is I would keep running into these things that I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning because I'd want to work on. Um, I had an ad looking uh, for books in parts of town that skewed elderly because that seemed mm -hmm. to be the better places to go to estate sales. And, you know, uh, an elderly Guatemalan couple was going to throw out uh, this handwritten notebook. They said it was in uh, their dad's office in Guatemala before they left. So it was from the twenties, maybe the teens. My mom's fluent in Spanish. And I thought for 20 bucks, she can help me figure this out. I didn't need her help. Uh, Google helped me figure out very quickly yeah. that it was the founding documents 
of a, the founding minute book of a political party that mm -hmm. overthrew their dictator mm -hmm. in 1919 or 20. Mm -hmm. I knew about the ABA back then, um, and I found uh, Beverly Carnot and sent it to her, and she sold that. Um, but stuff like that kept happening where I'm running into these like, wow, things mm -hmm. that could sell for, you know, wow. better than things. Twinkie money. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of long and boring how I finally transitioned into it uh, full time, but a huge, huge part of that is, is Kurt Sanflabin of of read them again books. Oh, I yeah. also, without Kurt, I, I think I'd probably still be a still lawyer. Still be a lawyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can thank all of these serendipitous points mm -hmm. on this linear pathway that mm -hmm. got you here. Yeah. It's pretty fabulous. So I don't have to ask you what attracted you to the book this. <laughs> I really don't. Well, yeah, you <laughs> know, it it's found sort of you. in my blood. It found you. It did. Yeah, exactly. And, um, um, and Kurt and, and any other, you know, mentors and people that were along on those, that Kurt, serendipitous path. Kurt's a great one. Sort of. His lovely wife. But, but Kurt, Mm. mentor with the capital M. I mean, I, mm. he, and talk about serendipity. Yeah. Um, about it. Either Craig Stark or somewhere in the book think world had said, you know, find a mentor who does this for a living. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually reached out to several dealers um, in various elite trade organizations uh, on both sides of the pond with a I know you don't know me, but could you be my mentor? And no one even responded. No one even politely said, sorry, I can't. Maybe they didn't get the emails, but now I get it. It's Kurt probably spent, if I were to guess, 80 to 100 hours a year for two years responding to my emails and cutting 15 to 20 years off my learning curve. That's incredible. Um, but many people have been kind to me. Uh, you know, Lauren Bear, Amir, mm -hmm. Tom Congleton, Brian Cassidy, you know, so many dealers have just, my first year of really doing this for a living, most of my revenue was selling to dealers. Yeah, um, yes. And so, but in terms of mentor, mentor, it, it's All it's it. Kurt with a giant yeah. M uh, and Cole Shaver is one of my closest friends in the business and he also uh, guided me a lot. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I bet you're doing the same. I'm kind of flattered that yes, now people are asking me questions. Mm -hmm. It kind of, I might be turning red. It just it no, kind of freaks fine. me out that <laughs> in such a short time, people are like getting my advice. I'm like, I'm not competent to give you that advice, but thanks for asking. Here's what I think. Here's what you think. Um, we yeah. all have a unique voice to lend to this process. Yeah. And you've got a, an intelligent approach to it. And you. you've, you've, you've got a voice too. So, and that's why you're here. Um, so I didn't mean to cut you off, okay. I, but you I, I wanted to ask you, you know, I think we can all glean from what you specialize in, what we heard about and how you got here. You're savvy, intelligent. How are you getting this beautiful voice, this narrative that you are able to build with a special material? How are you getting it out there? Fairs, catalogs, websites, open shop? Sure. Talk? What is, what are your business I thought the first question like? was, how did you get that voice? And my answer is I stole it. I yeah. mean, I... You know, I immersed myself in anybody's catalogs with overlapping interests. Mm -hmm. So it was Kurt, Congleton, Cassidy, Bear, maybe one or two others that I can't remember. Yeah. And so the idea was if they're doing all this effort to offer these things, There's hopefully they're actually selling them, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, you know, my first institutional sale came about because Congleton issued, I think, their first LGBT catalog. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea any of that stuff was marketable. And I found this incredibly cool thing in an antique shop for $26 that I did this stereotypical for me, long, long description. Um, and Kurt helped walk me through mm -hmm. uh, my first institutional sale uh, with that. But I wouldn't have bought it mm -hmm. without having seen the Between yeah. the Covers catalog yeah. earlier. So how do I get the word out? Yeah, what are you doing? Um, How does the business look now? You know, it's now especially coming from law uh, where advertising budgets, there's never any real sense of a return. It's month by month. Either mm. you spend $5,000 and turn it to 10, or you might spend $5,000 and you don't get any new clients that month in the consumer bankruptcy world. But in this business, I feel like every dollar I spend including, you know, just being at a fair, I mm -hmm. look at as, as just marketing. Mm -hmm. So um, the business has grown simply by issuing that first catalog. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then a couple of curators have also been really instrumental in, in this happening and being very kind to me and forwarding what I'm doing to other people. Like the one person who has been most instrumental, I just wanted to laugh when he said, the first time he said, do you mind if I forward your catalog to X? Like, and I'm oh, like, oh, let me check first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's how it started. You know, I, I issued the first catalog in January of 2017 and I, and I issued and it, I think, to X leaders. Uh, just catalog. Oh, uh, not a theme. It's okay. like this catalog, just oh, gotcha. cool stuff. Cool stuff. That, that's mostly, uh, you know, you primary do. source material, or if it's printed, it, it is hopefully something that this world hasn't really seen before gotcha. or, or is unfamiliar. So, like when I'm looking at something that's printed, mm -hmm. uh, if there is a competing copy out there, mm -hmm. I it's very unlikely I'll buy it. If there's more than a certain amount on OCLC, same thing, or if, mm -hmm. if the customers I, I had in mind for it. So I issued that first catalog and 50, and granted it wasn't a huge thing, but 50% of it sold to dealers in an hour after mm -hmm. I put it on Ex Libris. And, um, and then I started hearing from curators and then within about a year, maybe 18 months, it just started to mushroom. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the number one way is, is issuing uh, e-lists and print catalogs. Um, I'd like to do more fairs if I, if I could figure out a better way of managing getting to them. And, yeah. and so um, that is the hope is that I can do more fairs mm -hmm. uh, like this. It doesn't make sense. I do the small Texas fairs mm -hmm. because they're my friends and I want to be there and fly the flag. But presently, the way my model is, unless a fair is going to attract uh, institutional customers, um, it does make a lot of sense. But in such a short time, I've made so many great friends and none of and only a couple of them are in Texas that that's the only way I get to see them too. So, yeah. Um, so and yeah. some of that is what makes this life so great. Yeah. A lot of that's, you know, why we do this, right? Yeah. So that's I nice. don't think the website or uh, Abe, Biblio and eBay really do much in terms, although I have gotten some repeat customers from the sites. Mm -hmm. um, it's more the catalogs that are the okay. main marketing approach. Great. Well, we wish you continued progress mm, and continued you. mushrooming and more and more. And we'll watch for all that to come and in years to come. And yeah. thank you so much for sharing that concise, exciting story. <laughs> that was concise. <laughs> okay. Was.